I want to thank you, Father, this morning for the music that's been sung. So encouraging and so uplifting. I just want to thank you, Lord, for those young boys who are giving their hearts to you at this time in their lives. It's, a, it's the best time to be giving their hearts to you, Lord, before they fall into the nonsense that this world has to offer. They can make a difference now. And I want to praise you for that. It's so beautiful to see you, Lord. I hope that they'll win many souls, and I know that they will, for your glory. just want to pray today, Father, that you would just be in this place. You are in this place. You're everywhere. And you promise us, where two or more are gathered in your name, that you are, Lord, there among them in the midst of them. I just claim that through faith this morning. I want to ask that you would anoint this message, and that you would just be vindicated in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. It's a perfect picture. I want to speak to you this morning about Christ. And about how God is a beautiful, wonderful, amazing, compassionate, caring, understanding, perfect God. Because that's who He is. Amen? That's who He is. And a lot of people, unfortunately, have had their minds contorted to think something other than that. They have been maybe misled or misguided or misinformed. And their picture of Christ, and sometimes even well-meaning Christians have the incorrect picture of who God is. Come across that quite often. Hopefully today we can just elaborate on who He really is, amen? Who He really is. I want to start by saying this. If you've come into church this morning, I want you to know this thing. I want you to know that the Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. I want you to know right now that you are a child of God. It doesn't matter what baggage you came in here with this morning. It doesn't matter what you're suffering with this morning. It doesn't matter if you feel rejected or despised or downcast or downtrodden. You are a child of God. Are you with me? That's who you are. I want you to remember that and I want you to know it and I want you to hold on to it and never let go of it. You are a child of God the king of the universe. It doesn't matter if you feel unwell. You're still a child of God, amen? It doesn't matter if someone puts you down. You're still a child of God. It doesn't matter what happens to you outside of this building. You are still and will always be a child of God. Don't let anyone take that from you. Don't let anyone steal that from you. Don't let anyone rob you of that. You are a child of God. You're a child of God. And it says in that verse, therefore the world does not know us. Because it did not know him. And if you think about what Jesus went through, he came into his own world, which he had made, and they didn't recognize him, and they rejected him. Don't think for one second that Jesus doesn't understand what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be rejected. So if you come in here feeling rejected this morning, I want to tell you, Jesus knows what you're going through. You know what? The world doesn't know us because it doesn't know him. The world doesn't understand how even if everyone out there is rejecting you, you can come to a place and find God and you can find refuge and you can find peace. Even if your life is in some kind of a turmoil and everything seems to be an upheaval and it's not going right or the way you think it should be, you can still find peace, amen? My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives unto you. He tells us so many times that we can have peace. And what is peace? Jesus is the Prince of Peace, amen? So peace is essentially Jesus. So what do I need? I need Jesus, amen? Who do I need? I need Jesus. The simple solution to all of the earth's problems and calamities and woes is Jesus. The author and perfecter and the finisher of our faith. The way, the truth, and the life, it's Jesus. So instead of running here, there, and everywhere, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He wants to take care of you. He wants to look after you. He wants to restore you. He wants to heal you. He wants to help you. He wants to mold you. He wants to shape you. He wants to make you something special. And these aren't just words. I'm speaking this morning. It will be from the Bible, amen. From the Bible and the Bible. Behold what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us. It's you and me. It's plural. On us. That we should be called the children of God. The children of God. We are God's children. That's how we should treat each other too, as God's children. Think before you speak about somebody. 
That's God's child. That's God's child. The world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. <laughs> Let's get on with it. 1 John also, of John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. To those who believe in his name. To those who believe in his name. The King James Version uses the word power. The New King James Version uses the word sons. Or the right, actually uses the word the right. I want to explain to you this morning, a life in Christ is one that's filled with power. It really is. It's one that is filled with absolute power. I don't have to worry how I'm going to get through today. I don't have to worry about where my next paycheck is coming from. I don't have to worry about where my next meal is coming from. I don't have to worry about my wife who's been dreadfully sick. I don't have to worry. Do you know why? Because God gives me the power and the ability to rise up above that and be able to rest in Him and say, Carl, I've given you power. Everything's going to be okay. Just stay with me. I won't let you down. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. I'm with you all the way. Amen? That's the power you can have, that I can have, that's available to us free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift. Amen? It's a gift, and it's given to you by the greatest gift giver of all, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ, our Savior. I want to encourage you from the Bible this morning. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things were written aforetime, talking about the Scriptures, were written for our learning, for our whatever, and for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, this book I commend to you, the only book this morning, might have what? Might have hope. And we need hope sometimes, don't we? Oh, we need hope. And we can find hope in the Scriptures. So I'm encouraging you, I'm imploring you to open the Scriptures, amen? Because when you feel down, the best place you can go is to this book. You see, Satan wants to make you so discouraged, he wants to keep you from opening the pages of this book because he knows in this book you can be restored, you can be built up, you can get going again, and you can keep on keeping on. You need to open the pages of this book because this book will change your life. I speak from someone of 15 years' experience of how this book, this book, has changed my life. Not any other book, this book. This book's a powerful book. Read it. <laughs> read the book. Amen? Read the book. I'm going to read a story out now found in Genesis chapter 22. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22, I'd love for you to do that. The reason I'm going to share this story is because I want to help people get away from their distorted view of who God is. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. Abraham must have been listening. I like that. Abraham, here I am. Must have been listening. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. He's probably like, sorry? Sorry? It wasn't what I was expecting to hear. So Abraham rose early in, the, early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and he rose and he went to the place of which God had told him. He's obedient. I like that there how we know that he loves his son. God knows that he loves his son and he calls him to do something that seems unusual and it was unusual. And the reason why when you read this, and David's done a really good um, explanation of this in times past, was because he lived in a heathen nation. And the heathen gods used to have child sacrifice. So somewhere in his thinking, obviously there was some distortion going on about who God really is and who God was and what God would require of a servant of his. So Abraham rose early in the morning, he saddled his donkey, and he took his two young men with him. Isaac, his son also, he split the wood and off he went. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. Listen to this next bit. And we will come back to you. Now there's a statement of faith right there. What does he say? And we will come back to you. He wasn't talking about himself in the wood. He was talking about himself and the son, amen, Isaac. We will come back. But hang on, I thought you were going up there to sacrifice your son. He had faith enough to know that God, if you read it in Hebrews, could raise his son up from the dead. We will come back, but I'll be obedient to what you're asking me to do. We'll come back. 
He probably quivered maybe when he said that statement, but he stepped out in faith. We will. We will. Sometimes we need a we will attitude. Amen. We will make it through. We will rise up again. We will get the victory. We will continue to fight this battle. Amen. Why? Because Jesus has already fought it, fought it on our behalf. He's already fought it on our behalf. You're on a winning team. You're on a winning team. Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand. It's verse 6 and a knife. Two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. A better translation is, God will provide himself the lamb for an offering. Amen. So right here in Genesis, we see Jesus put into the story, the beautiful story of Jesus, the lamb who really is a sacrifice. And you'll see this in just a moment. It's actually Christ himself. God will provide himself a lamb, a sacrifice. He will be the one who will be sacrificed, not your son, my son. Amen. Wow. Don't tell me that the gospel isn't alive in the first book of the Bible. The gospel is alive and well. Amen. It's flourishing with Christ everywhere. You just have to have your eyes open to see it. Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and he placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Now, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad. Don't do that. Or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Obviously, this is God speaking here. It's not an angel. It's the angel of God. It's God himself speaking. He's not withholding his son from him. Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I've sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand, which is on the seashore and where come from that lineage. And your descendants shall possess the gate of the enemies and your seed or nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Amen. I love this chapter. I love that Abraham decided to call the place where he was going to sacrifice his son, where he didn't have to sacrifice his son because God already had a sacrifice prepared, the ram, that was caught in the thicket by the horn. Remember those crown of thorns that were placed on the head of Jesus. Do you remember that? The depiction is beautiful right here. And he says, you know, the Lord will, the Lord will what? Provide. I want to encourage you this morning. The Lord will provide. The Lord's going to provide. You don't understand quite exactly how just yet. The Lord will provide. He's done it before, and He'll do it again. I'm the same yesterday, today, and for the ever. I change not, says the Lord. He's the same God in Abraham's time as He is today. Same person, same being, God Almighty. I will provide. Don't worry about all the exterior things that are going on that might trouble you or worry you or cause you to be anxious, don't worry. Just know this thing, God will provide. Are you with me this morning? God will provide. God will provide. Be confident in that. Rest in that. Trust in that and know that. Know that. You see, what I'm dealing with here this morning really is the condition of the mind. It's the condition of the mind that God wants to deal with, I believe, with us. Because when we get it right up here, what happens from here is there is an outworking of what's going on up top. So the way that we live demonstrates what we're thinking and what we understand. And we understand things through what? Through experience. Through experience. So when you come into a dark experience, you learn to trust in God and rest on God. And what I do is I call past experiences where God has delivered me from saying that, God, I have seen your hand in me before. I have seen that you will provide, and you will get me through the same thing. You will get my family through this. Everything will be okay. Everything will be okay. 
Everything will be okay. Now, I like this next story. It's found in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 17. Let's go there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's actually found in two of the Gospels, this account, this story. Mark and Luke, but I'm going to read from Mark today. 1 through 17. Again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house, talking about Christ. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, nor even um, near the door, and he preached the word to them. I love what that young boy said. He said, I give my heart to Jesus, and I want to, be, I want to preach. Man, this is what you want to do. Preach the word of God. And then came to him, bringing a, they came to him, sorry, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. How many men was he carried by? So here's this paralytic. Could he make it to Jesus by himself? No, he's crippled. He couldn't make it on his own. But he had friends, amen? He had friends who could take him where? To where he needed to be. And where did he need to be? At the feet of Jesus. You see, we have friends, we have family who are broken, who are confused, who are lost right now, and the best place for them to be is at the feet of Jesus. But we need to lead them to the feet of Jesus by the way that we live our lives, amen? And we can't take them to somebody and show them something and tell them about our experience if we don't have one. Are you with me? My wife has been very, very sick, been in hospital for a couple of weeks. She's been released now, although... She's not really getting any better. There's fluid on her heart, and there's some, there's some issues. And you know what? I was really encouraged last week. I wasn't able to attend church. Unfortunately, I was looking after my wife. But the principal of my school came to church to encourage me and to support me, even though he didn't know that I wasn't going to be here. He thought, oh, maybe I might not be. But he came to this vicinity, not an admitted, came to this vicinity to encourage me on my journey, amen? Now, that is true Christianity. Because he knows that there's a need. He knows that there's suffering. He knows that there's things taking place. He knows that we're under pressure. He knows that we're being persecuted. He knows we're under trial. So what does he do? He's trying to encourage me in my walk with who? With Jesus, amen? We've got to lead people to Jesus. He's the answer. He's the solution. He's the key that opens the door. He is the one who can rescue us and can rescue those who are lost, just like he rescued you and I. Jesus. So what did these great friends do? They brought him to Jesus. They brought him to Jesus. Jesus saw their faith. This is after he's been lowered down to the roof. You know what? They did whatever it took. They started smashing up their roof, and they put their friend down from the top of it. I'm sure they paid for it later on. We'll have to ask them about that when we get there, but I'm sure they fixed it up. But that's what they did. They lowered him down there. And listen to what happened. This is a really pertinent point I'm about to talk about. When they had broken through, they let down the bed in which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Well, hang on a second. He's a cripple. What does he need? Well, he's going there, obviously. The friends are hoping that Jesus will do what? That Jesus will heal his physical malady. Is that right? But Jesus doesn't heal his malady straight away. What Jesus says, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. What is it that Jesus is doing here? Well, Jesus is dealing with the mind. Amen? Jesus is dealing with the mind. You see, I would rather be a cripple and in a relationship with Jesus than be in perfectly good health and lost without Jesus. So Jesus deals with the mind. He says, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with all the problems, all the issues, all the challenges that you're facing right now. Your sins are forgiven, amen? Your sins are forgiven. Some of us in this church are maimed. There are people right now in this church who are dying. Right now. Literally dying. We're all dying to a degree. Some a lot faster than others. And you need to know this, your sins, amen, when you confess your sins, God is just and faithful to forgive you of your sins and do what? Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You're in a right standing with Christ Jesus right now. If you confess your sins to Him, He is faithful to forgive you and He will bring you on board with His team, amen. That's the team that I want to be on. So know that God deals with the mind. He deals with the mind. He tells you, it's going to be okay. You're forgiven. Come on my team. Walk with me. But then something else wonderful takes place. He knew what was going on around among the observers, observers, and he says to them, which is it easier to say to this paralytic man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, don't you love that word, arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, 
I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go home. Immediately he arose, took up the bed and went out in the presence of them all so that everyone was amazed and started to glorify God saying, far out, we've never seen anything like this before. He was fortunate enough that he was healed from his physical malady and he was able to walk. That might not be the case for you. God doesn't always promise us that your body will be in perfect harmony with the way you would like it to be. But he was healed and you can be healed too. Amen. You may receive a healing. I've seen it. I've actually seen it with my own eyes where people have been healed in front of me. It can happen. doesn't mean it has to, but it can. Don't ever give up believing that it can happen too. It can happen. He went out again by the sea, and the multitudes came to him, and he taught them, and he passed by. He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. I'll explain why I'm reading this in just a moment. He arose, and he followed him. Good thing to do. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. When the disciples and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Here comes my point. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, of a doctor, but those who are sick, well, that's obvious, but then what does he say? What does he say next? I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Interesting. Interesting. He's talking about those who obviously have a physical malady. They they need a physician. But he says, you know, I didn't come to call those people who are well. I've come to call those who are sick. And then he says, and he makes this analogy. And he makes it clear. And I think the point he's trying to make: it's not the righteous people that Jesus is calling. It's the sinners, Amy, because they are the ones who are truly sick. Are you with me? They're intoxicated with sin. And that's what he's coming to rescue us from. And no doctor can heal you from that, except for the master of all doctors, Jesus Christ himself, the true doctor. He's come to set us free. You are free from your sin. You're free from your sin. I want to encourage you this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, comfort, I like that word, who comforts us all in our tribulation or our trials or our hardships, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with those, with, sorry, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I want to tell you a story. While my wife was in hospital on her bed, feeling like she's going to die, because that's basically what she's going through, there was a young lady come into the hospital and my wife is in the cardiac ward, so everyone's around the 70s or the 80s, because, you know, mostly old people have problems with their heart. And there's this young, beautiful, 30-something, I won't tell you age, she'll kill me, year old in there. Well, one day when she was in there, another young lady came in. This young lady's about 26 years of age. And I took my family to visit our two children, because they hadn't seen my wife for a few days. We're trying to kind of keep them away from that, because hospitals aren't the best place for little children. And I brought them in to see mom, and mom was so encouraged by that. And my daughter picked up one of the um, cases of flour that she'd been given. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Mike and Tammy Ellsner and Gail Slide and others for visiting my wife and David Asher. And took those flowers to this young girl in the be- bed next door to my wife. Now, later on when, when we'd left, she said to my wife, are you a seven-day Adventist? My wife's like, well, actually, I am. And she said, I knew it. I knew you were a seven-day Adventist. My wife's like, well, how did you know that? By the way that your family was interacting. You've got your Bible there, and I send you praying together. Oh, you're a vegetarian. I knew you were a seven-day Adventist. It turns out that this young lady, she said this to my wife. She said, oh, you know, my mum and dad have been attending church sporadically a little bit lately. I said, really? Where have they been attending? She said, Kingsford Seventh-day Adventist Church. Don't talk to me about the providence of God, amen. See, my wife had come out of hospital, went back into hospital, amen. And when that young lady was struggling at night with what she was going through, my wife was able to get up and comfort her even in her time of grief. Praise the name of Jesus. You see, there's power in the blood. The best way, and thank you, Jill Marshall, for helping me to understand that, is to, when you're struggling, take the focus off yourself 
and put it on other people's pain and other people's suffering and other people's sickness and encourage them. And that will lift you up. That will lift you up. That's how you get through it, isn't it? You take the focus off yourself and you place it on someone else in more need than your own. So comfort each other. You have been comforted by God. You use what He gives you to help others. These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In Christ you might have what? Come on now, in Christ you might have what? Peace. But listen to what he's saying. In the world you will have tribulation. Are you with me? You will. God doesn't promise you it's all smooth sailing. You will have tribulation. There will be times that are going to be hard. But be of good cheer. Why? Because he says, I have overcome the world. Are you with me? He says, I have overcome the world. Don't worry about the world and what it has to throw at you. I have overcome the world. I've been there. I've done that. I've made a way for you. Amen. You can come home with me to heaven. We sang about it today. A beautiful place where there'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more of this pain. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be none of that nonsense. And it will be gone and done away with forever. Forever. I have overcome the world. And if you come into Christ, then you yourself are an overcomer. Amen. You overcome in the blood of Jesus. His blood which covers you. His righteous robe which you put on. It's a gift. And the shoes which he puts on the feet. You're no longer a slave. Slaves didn't have shoes. You're not a slave except to righteousness. Amen. To a new way of living. To a new way of acting. To a new way of speaking. You, brothers and sisters, are no longer a slave. You have been liberated. Let's act like it, shall we? Let's live like it, shall we? Let's be all we can be, shall we? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, whatever it takes. If I need a little shake-up, if I need some of my miscontorted understanding of who Jesus really has changed, bring it on, Jesus. Whatever it takes, I want to be the man that you want me to be in this generation. Because I know I only get one shot. There's no second chance. Let's be honest. There's no second chance. God will give you second chances, but once your life is done and dusted and you take your last breath, that's it. That's it. What will have you done with the life that Jesus gave you? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who is promised is faithful. He's what? He's faithful. The Bible even tells us he's faithful when we are what? Faithless. Faithless. Without it, he still has it. He's always faithful. Now, where am I reading these promises from? I'm reading them from the Scriptures, the Word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You need to hide this book within your heart so that you won't sin against God. It's like a hammer, the Bible says, that breaketh the rock into pieces. And gee whiz, my heart needs some breaking sometimes. But you can be confident that He has promised that He will be faithful. Hang on. Hold on. Cling on. Don't let go. Do not let go of Jesus. He will not let you go. Do you know why? It is an impossibility for Jesus to let you go. Why? It says he has engraven you on the palm of his hand. You are engraven on the palm of the hand of the Lord Almighty. He cannot let you go. He doesn't do the letting go of. We do. Don't do it. In your time of suffering, don't do it. Just hold on. Just hold on. Hold on. You will get through it. The verse could be, Simply this, hold on to the promises. But you need to know the promises, amen? They need to be in you. Hold on to the promises and don't let go. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. The crown of what? The crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Don't you want the crown of life? Don't you want to place that on your head or allow Jesus to place it on your head one day? The crown of life. You've just got to hold on. It's coming. Mel mentioned it. It's coming. Jesus is coming again. And it won't be long from this time, I believe, that Jesus will take us home to be with him. This world is in chaos. This world is falling apart at the seams. It's tanking. It's going under. It's sinking. We've got to get off it and get on the straight and narrow. The straight and narrow that leads where? That leads to the best, most blessed, most wonderful, most, I can't explain it, perfect place. 
heaven, in the immediate presence of God. It's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. And that, I'm sure, is where you want to be. I know you're sitting there like, yeah, you want to be there, don't you? Otherwise, why do you come here every week? You come here because you want to be there, because you know there's more to this life than what you're experiencing now. And there is. There's so much more. There's so much more. There's a whole lot more. And it's coming. It's coming. Just keep watching this space. Jesus will come again. He said he would, and he will. He said he would, and he will. Brothers and sisters, no matter what you're going through, no matter what maybe your understanding of God was previously to being here today, thinking, oh, God's put this on. God didn't put that on you. God doesn't want people to suffer. God made the world, and the world was perfect. That wasn't his doing. What he does, though, is he uses people who are suffering to understand how he suffered and how he can restore and help and heal and fix. And he wants to use you. He wants to use you. And he wants to use me. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward and sing a final song. You don't have a song. You need a song. You think about it while I keep going for two more minutes. Mel, give me something. God is good, amen. David, put me on the spot. It's your turn. God is good. And I want to encourage you, please, brothers and sisters, if you haven't yet made a decision for Jesus Christ, you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. And this isn't a flippant thing. These young men have made a decision that is going to change the course of their life. Isn't it exciting? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it beautiful? Five young men. Five young boys who are going to be something now because they decided to follow Jesus. Don't you want to be something? I want to be remembered as being something and someone that stood up for Christ. I want to meet people in heaven. I want them to come up to me and say, Carl, you know, the way that you lived your life, there was something about you that I wanted and I decided to follow Jesus. That's what it was for me. I met a man who knew Jesus and he lived for Jesus. And I wanted what he had. And that's how I got converted, because I accepted Christ because of the way that that man was living. And I could see that man had what? He had power. He had power, not like the other people that I'd met in the world. He could say no to certain things. His diet was impeccable. He treated people with respect. He was humble. He was kind. I couldn't put my finger on it. But man, when he showed me the Scriptures, Jesus, it all made sense. And a penny dropped. And a penny dropped. How are we going over there, team? God is good, amen. And I will appear when we're done. Praise the Lord. God is so good. It's actually the song that we're going to sing together. And we're going to do it a cappella. Will you stand and sing with us? I don't think that needs to be an item. That's a testimony. That's what that is. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He took my sins. He took my sins.
Now I'm free. Now I'm free. I want to show of hands this morning of who wants to experience that liberation in you. And I'm encouraged if you've not made that decision, please just give Jesus a chance. Just give him a chance. Try it out for yourself. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Let us close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning, Lord, that you know what's best. That you know everything about us. You know what time we rise, what time we go to sleep. You're acquainted with all of our ways, the Bible tells us. And yet you still love me. That's truly amazing. I want to pray, Lord, today that this message that the penny will drop. That we would be greatly encouraged, Lord, to know that no matter what we're going through, you're right there beside us, championing us on. You can do it, son. You can do it, daughter. Just hang on and hold on. It's going to be okay. And Lord, for those who are dying, I want you, Lord, to help them to understand that you will take care of their family, that you will provide for their needs, that it will be okay. It will be okay. I thank you that you always have our best intentions before us, Lord. And I want to ask, Father, that we would just become what you've called us to be, your children, and that we would live like it, Lord, with power, and we would show people your blessed hope, your real hope, the only hope of the human race, because you, God, are a God of grace. My song in the night, the one true light, the way maker for every single person who's ever been born or will be born, we find in you, Jesus Christ, in your alone. And we ask you, bless the remainder of the Sabbath, the baptism this afternoon. We pray a blessing on our visitors today, and we thank you oh so dearly for them, our brothers and sisters. And we ask these things in the righteous and holy name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, let everyone say, Amen.